everybody, welcome back to Stabibi Sports Brawl Season 2, everybody, right here. I'm your host, Bondi Ammons and TMG Entertainment, Jonathan, the Rock Master Peck, right here. And for me, well, I got these two judges right here on one bottom right here. Look on his left side corner, probably getting something. I don't know what that is. Jacob, Papa West, how you doing, Jacob? Ah, uh, doing good. Had to get a phone to, to use as a timer. Um, since you just literally threw that on my lap, just like my daughter. Uh, I have some help today, so we're all good. Uh, but no, I'm ecstatic. Uh, I ended your Iron Man run in a uh, free-for-all uh, a little bit earlier, so I'm glad to see you again, Jonathan. For those of you who don't know what I mean by that, it's sort of an Iron Man match at a different uh, YouTube network. If you so don't mean, I'll show you all on my Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. But anyway... Uh, I mean, on another bottom right here, my not judge. We got Nikki Solid. How you doing, Nikki? Hey, doing all right, guys. Uh, I didn't have my phone ready either, Wes, so uh, you're good there. <laughs> very good, very good. And right now today, this is going to be so two brand new players into sports bra right here. On my left side right here, we got Ethan, the electric Klein. How you doing, Ethan? Doing good, doing good. Uh, made my debut for TMG for uh, late TV fights uh, the other day, and I'm ready to just keep chugging along, waiting for my next match there, waiting for my first match in a couple other leagues, but ready to get started with Sports Brawl. Very good indeed. And our next part is brand new to Sports Brawl right here, but sort of a veteran around different fan leagues or somewhere. So we got Dan Skip Allen. How you doing, Danny? Hey in there, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for having me. I've been bugging Sue Brath to get me in here for a while now, you know. But I have a bad reputation, so I understand why he uh, probably didn't want me to get in here. All right. Well, but, okay then. Uh, so I just put a Mandalorian hill on Nikki for a second. Uh, okay, okay then. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, everybody's right here together. We got to bring this sports brawl ready to go. And whoever wins right here, you know, some people, when you two are new right here, here are sort of the rules. We get a nice couple, 30 seconds of, of the opening right here. We got five minutes on your arguments right here. And on the 60 seconds, you're closing right here. And one, you got one minute extensions right here. And after that, if both of you tied after four questions, we would do a speed round question if both of you are tied. So... I just want to make sure, is everybody ready for this? Yeah, I'm good to go. All yep. right. Let's do this thing. Sports ball. We're going question number one. And out of uh, our dance strength is the NFL. Well, currently right now, the sports world is not doing it well. That sort of makes sense right here. But currently right now is NFL free agency. Yes, free agency. There have been some great free agency signings over the years. There have been some not so Great ones at the same time, though. So I put this question out there and the category in the NFL. What is the worst free agent signing of all time? So said NFL is Dan strength. So Dan, we we'll start out with you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's really a no brainer on this one. I mean, you don't even need a brain to think about this one. This is like the most obvious person, Albert Hainsworth. This guy was a beast for the Tennessee Titans, and he gets this contract for the Washington Redskins for $100 million, and then the guy, S-H-I-T's, the buck. You know, she, I don't want to curse, but he kind of kicks – he kind of does crappy, and then he gets suspended by them, and then it comes out that he wanted to get suspended. He didn't want to stay with the Washington Redskins, but he ended up getting $36 million from him anyway – because he's just going to use them to get a big contract and go somewhere else. And it turns out to be a gigantic fiasco uh, for the Redskins, and they look like complete fools in the NFL circles. Um, and this guy turned out to be a complete jerk. You know what I mean? Come on, man. Don't be don't be like that. Don't be using teams to get a contract just so you can be an a-hole and go somewhere else. I mean, $100 million, $36 million, it's a lot of money. And do your job. Go someplace, be a professional, do your job. I mean, this that was ridiculous what he did. Okay, then. We got Albert Hainter signed with the Washington Redskins. And before I will get to Ethan's point, as I live in Virginia around 
the big skin find myself. So that part was not wrong in my eyes, but not going to put a true favoritism on that one. So we're going with Ethan with his choice. Uh, yeah. So obviously uh, with Albert Hainsworth being off the board, uh, looking around to me, there was a pretty obvious choice uh, for me here. And it was Javon Walker signing with the Oakland Raiders. Here's the problem with Javon Walker. Uh, and, and the reason that is such a bad signing for the Oakland Raiders, which in my lifetime, uh, just, year in, year out, they're an example of what you should not do when you're running your franchise. And what you definitely should not do when you're running your franchise is sign a nobody to a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract. Six years, $55 million. This guy, when I say Javon Walker, I was saying this to my friends there, they're like, who'd you pick? I said that. They're like, who? Who? Yeah. Who? That he had no reason to be getting a contract of this way. Albert Hainsworth, did it blow up? Yes, it did. But this contract was given to someone who had not earned it. That's what makes it so bad is that they had no reason to be giving Javon Walker that kind of uh, commitment in money and in time. And for those efforts, uh, his first season with them, he caught 15 passes for less than 200 yards, completely blew up. The next season, didn't even step on the field for him before they cut him and had to eat that whole salary. Javon Walker is the worst free agent signing. I'll concede the rest of my time. Okay. So we got Dan from Albert Hainsworth signing with the Redskins. We got Ethan's pick with Javon Walker signing with the Raiders. Jacob, you got the timer ready to go. All right. One you the time starts when one of you begins talking. I'll tell you what. There's other teams, uh, Ethan, that sign players that that don't don't end up being a great player. They have contracts. Fifty five million, they only have to pay the guy sixty. Albert Hainsworth got $36 million of a $100 million contract, and it wasn't like he didn't get injured. That guy from the Raiders got injured, and he played half the season, one of the seasons. And I understand where he, he didn't fulfill his contract, but that's nothing compared to Albert Hainsworth. So here's the thing. Albert Hainsworth at least still – did, it was not good, but he still did statistical things for the Washington Redskins. That first year, he had four sacks. Now, he was coming off of an eight-and-a-half sack season. Yeah, so he's not all the way up there. But based on his yearly average, aside from the one dominant year in Tennessee the last year, he was sitting around that five-sack thing. So he was actually up to about where he was prior to the one big season. Javon Walker did absolutely nothing thing for this team and then they just had to cut him and eat that salary albert hainsworth at least got them a fifth round pick now that maybe isn't you know i mean obviously that's not he what they would have gotten at the beginning but when they traded him at least they got something for him well the difference is he got hurt for the raiders so he only played a half a year that one year hainsburg basically quit on the team he he didn't want to play for them because he wanted to get a contract somewhere else and take all their money and then go quit and be a, be be released or be traded and then make them lose all that money and then he gets to go somewhere else and he still gets rich off of it. That's the difference. That's this guy was stealing from the team. Javon Walker was injured. Okay, I mean I'll give you that Albert Hainsworth maybe is the biggest jerk of a free agent signed in history, but again, he at least went out there in that first season and did things on the field and i mean if you're if you're a football fan you know the the most the biggest threat on the defense is going to get double teamed so he's still getting four sacks with the double teams with all that and he's opening up opportunities for other guys on the defensive line and even if javon walker hadn't have gotten hurt he was on pace to to have less than 400 yards receiving two touchdowns and like 40 catches that's still horrendously awful that's still bad so it's not like oh he got hurt that's why he was terrible, and then he got hurt. But guys like that, I mean, guys are busts all the time. You see the potential in a player from the Broncos. Guy looks like he's going to turn out to be something. You sign him to a deal. Yeah, Al Davis. You know, Al Davis kind of like likes to spread the money around a little bit. But the Redskins were paying this guy a boatload of money. It was a lot on the line. This guy needed to be a big time player, and yeah, so he got four sacks one year. And the, but the bottom line is. He basically didn't do much of anything. All he did was basically steal their money and then want to get traded and piss off Shanahan. You know, say and Shanahan has to go into, into press conferences and start bickering back and forth with him. You know, 
there's players all over the league every year that that are busts in the league and get signed and don't make money. I mean, it happens all the time. But the biggest of the biggest is Albert Hainsworth. I mean, you can't. There's no way you can say that Javon Walker compares to Albert Hainsworth. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, Albert Hainsworth was promised more money, but he also produced a lot more in his career before that. If the Redskins, and here's my point, if the Redskins didn't give him that $100 million, there were 20 other teams lined up to give him that same contract because of the clout that he had earned. Nobody was in line to give no-name Javon Walker this kind of money. It was just another example of the Raiders just throwing money, throwing Band-Aids on problems that really don't solve anything. And it was just another example of how the Raiders organization does not know how to One sign minute. free the agents. Party. They're probably trying to give the quarterback some weapons. And how Hainsburg doesn't quit if he gets assigned by somebody else. If somebody else signs him for $100 million, he doesn't quit on the team like he did the Redskins. He would have probably played for somebody if somebody like the Cowboys or the Patriots or the Giants or some bigger team that would have been more competitive in the playoff. He probably doesn't quit them. The Redskins were so bad. He probably just, well, I'm quitting on you guys. I want to just get traded and go somewhere else where I can win. It's all about winning with player. They want to go somewhere – but he did steal that money from the Redskins, man. It was all about a thievery right there. Yeah, again, I mean, it it seems like it's just coming down to. I agree with you. I agree with what you're saying. He is a jerk, but again, he at the end of the day did do things for that team. He got sacks and he took double teams and gave other players an opportunity to succeed when the focus was on him. Time. All right, time. All right. Hmm. Very good. Very good. Very good compelling answer for both of you. All right. Each of you will have 60 seconds for your closing argument. Dan, we'll start with you when you begin talking. All right. So Albert Hainsworth is a star for the Tennessee uh, Titans. Gets this huge contract, goes to the Washington Redskins, Gets a hundred million dollar contract. Yeah, he might get a couple sacks here or there, but he basically quit on the team. They end up he ends up getting thirty six million, which is what he wanted in the end. He wanted to get the, as much money he could, then then basically quit on the team and don't do anything after that. Then have them trade him away, and he's still rich with thirty six million dollars. Javon Walker gets injured, and then he gets left off, and then he has to leave the team. And a lot of teams, $55 million is nowhere near as much as $100 million and end up with $36 million, which is what Hainsworth got. And uh, team, players go to teams all the time to get signed, and they end up getting hurt. Quarterbacks, there's busts all the time. Look at Nick Foles for the Jaguars this past year. I mean, he, this guy's a Super Bowl MVP player, and he goes to the Jaguars. The guy's a bust. Time. Time. Okay, uh, Ethan, 60 seconds on you when you begin to start talking. So again, my, my final point, uh, it's the point I've been driving home this whole time, is the fact that was it a bad contract for Albert Hainsworth? Absolutely. But his production earned the fact that someone was going to have to pay him that much money. And at the end of the day, the stats that he put up that first season in Washington were about his his career average, aside from the one dominant season where he won NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Javon Walker, on the other hand, yeah, he had a couple decent seasons, but he was never a superstar caliber player or even really uh, the caliber player that deserved $55 million. And what they got for that $55 million was absolutely zilch, nada, nothing, no help for their quarterback, absolutely nothing at all. And then when it was over, it was done. When Albert Hainsworth was over, whether or not he quit on the team, which he did, and again, he's a jerk, they were still able to trade him and get something. Was it a lot? No, it wasn't. But they got a fifth round pick, and that's that's draft capital that you can use how you see fit moving forward to try to recuperate some of the loss from that bad contract. Time. Wow. Whoa. Okay. Um, very good first round arguments between Dan and Ethan right here. I just want to say, well done. Well done for both of you. But we do need to get a point right here. And I'm going to my judges in the bottom first. I'm going to start with you, Papa West. What argument can sway you and who gets the point? Oh, I'm really upset you went with me first. Uh, no, that was really good. Uh, you, you have two different sides of the argument. You have, um, you know, Dan bringing home the, uh, uh, 
Connor Hainsworth's performance makes it the worst signing, whereas uh, with Ethan, Javon just didn't make sense at the time, uh, which turned around didn't make sense at all. Um, one thing I, I'm going to go with, I'm, I'm going to go with Ethan on it, uh, mainly because of a point he brought up that said Albert Hainsworth's previous year, I mean, there were teams lining up to give him that money, uh, and it just so happened to, to fall on the Redskins. Uh, which Dan didn't really do much with. Um, and then the uh, the whole saying, you know, Javon Walker's a nobody. Uh, Dan, you said teams are doing that, uh, but they're not putting that much money on on a lot of nobodies. Um, so I'm I'm gonna give it again, slide of some margin. This was a really good one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Ethan though. Okay. Why well, no Ethan? Uh, Nikki, what argument that swayed you and who should get the point? Uh, yeah, I think both of them made really good points and articulated well why their signing was a bad signing. And uh, I'm going to give the point to Dan. I think he just articulated better uh, the overall failure of the free agent signing. And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll give my point to Dan. Whoa. 1-1 uh, one, one tie. Now it's up to me. Ooh. Okay, then. Very good arguments for both of you and both of you do have the reason why the team afterward during the cap break really just didn't turn out to be all that good right here. Might affect the team afterwards the signing. But the person for me who gets a point for me, I actually go with uh, Dan on this one because he put, all the, it, he put points right here why the Albert Hancock signing itself might not only his performance, but the money on the team itself right here and the value right here. So I'm going to get my point to Dan. So in the first round, Dan gets the point right here. We got now one nothing. Dan right here. Don't worry, you think you will get back in the game right here. So this is going to be very good indeed. So we're going with round number two and his the category of the Olympics is uh, Ethan's strength right here. And the question is this. What is the best Summer Olympics moment of the 2010s? So, again, Olympics is Ethan's strength. So, I'm going with Ethan first. Yeah, so for me, the best moment of the Summer Olympics since 2010, uh, bar none, has to be uh, whatever nickname you want to go with, the Fierce Five, the Final Five, the Fab Five, whichever it is, it's the U.S. women's gymnastics team uh, just dominating the, all of those events in 2016 down in Rio. Um, going in, they were favored. Absolutely. They were looked upon as a team that were going to have the opportunity to do a lot of damage. Uh, but no one going into it saw how much damage these girls would do. They won the team event. They won the gold in that. And then each individual girl won medals in all of the individual events as well, which is something a gymnastics team uh, that's absolutely unheard of uh, to be able to send that many uh, single competitors out and win the team thing as a whole and to win gold in multiple events, including the team one. And not only that, these girls did it in, in such a time and in such a way. I mean, you know, I mean, this is fun. We want to have fun. We want to talk sports. But the little bit of the political side of it is this is the start of the, around the time that the Me Too movement is happening and women are trying to have more of a voice. And I, I'm not going to stand on that soapbox because obviously I am not a woman, but what an inspirational moment that was to see this group of girls stand up, stand next to each other and just destroy the competition, just run over the competition uh, with ease at times, it seems like. So their domination in 2016, the Fab Five, Fierce Five, Final Five, those women in Rio. Time. Okay. We got the 2016 Women's Dynastic moment right here. Um, Dan, we're going with your choice. Uh, my choice is the 2012 Olympics in London uh, with Michael Phelps. Uh, I could have chose 2016, but I wanted to go with 2012 because I wanted to show that he won. He actually broke the medals record uh, of uh, 20, I believe, was the medals record. He broke that record. But then also, he, you know, he won silver, two silvers with his own teammates, um, but he won four golds by himself. So he is a contributor to a team like – the the uh the the four by one hundred medley and the in some of these and 
excuse me if I get some of these names wrong. I'm not a uh, swimmer guy. I'm not a, a big s swimming guy, so I might get some of these names wrong or some of these what they're called wrong. Uh, but but just competitor um, by any competitor in the um, Olympics, and he's now the all-time medal winner in the history of the Summer Olympics, which makes him the greatest athlete in a, in the United States history uh, in the Olympics. And for that, I wanted to go with the 2012 Olympics and what he what he what he did and what he was able to accomplish. Okay, we got Ethan's pick of the 2012 U.S. Olympics gymnastics team versus uh, Dan's. Michael Phelps won a bunch of gold medals in the 2012 Olympics. So you two, bite it out. Yeah, so I mean, I would say for me, the thing with Michael Phelps is I remember watching the 2008 Olympics in Beijing where he's just event after event, gold, gold, gold. He sweeps gold every event that he's in, sets this standard. And then in 2012, um, not that anyone expected a complete repeat, uh, but he, he, he had lost a step and, and it came out. I mean, this was when he was struggling. Uh, he was going through some things with drugs. He, he had had issues with those. He had failed a couple tests at a couple different events and it came out. All of this was kind of surrounding that and a lot of issues with the, the men's swim team. And frankly, at the end of the day, they disappointed in 2012. He bounced back and actually won more golds at the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Yes, he broke the record in 2012, but after his dominance in 08, it was kind of a moot point that he would get that someday. The bigger, more awesome thing for his career was sweeping in 08. Yeah, well, all those awards in 08, that's the, that's the kind of like precursor to what he did in 2012. But he went silver with the team, and then he wins four more golds by himself. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, people don't realize Olympics are four years apart from one another. So for him to go and do so good in 2008, then do so good and break the records, all these records in 2012, and then go on in 2016 and, and win a few more, I mean, that tells you how dominant of an athlete, not just an Olympic athlete, but an overall athlete. Where your pick, the Olympic team, they had one great Olympics. Where were those girls the next Olympics, which we, uh, I, I believe we're not going to get this year's Olympics after the, what the see what's going on. We might not even get this year's. Where are those girls? Where were they before? It's a one hit wonder. You get one year. They, they're the darlings of the country and a couple of them win a couple individual awards and they're all over NBC and commercials. But this guy has done it 2008, 2012, 2016, but the records were set in 2000. 12 and you know yeah you're right you had lochte ryan lochte and his shenanigans and some of the stuff that was going on in 2012 but it's still the record holder the greatest olympic athlete of all time uh yeah so actually the crazy thing about gymnastics is that um usually those athletes don't compete in multiple olympics because of what they have to put their bodies through for that but gabby douglas and Allie raceman were actually on the 2012 team in london and they did have success they had limited success because of their limited role but they were there for that and that's what makes it so great is that they put their bodies through those rigors they kept going and four years later came back in 2016 and they were the two biggest names because they were the captains of the team and they led that team in dominant fashion the way michael phelps dominated in 2008 in 2012 uh, he he did not win the way that he did, and he actually lost some of his better events. He did win golds. He did have some success, but he did not have the same level of success that he had set for himself. And what makes 2012 so disappointing is that we see he still could achieve that if he had had the same level of preparation because he did achieve it again in 2016 by doing that. So just by numbers, you have 08, you have 2016, and you have 2012 as his least successful just in terms of victories at the Olympics. Well, we've had, and you know, you're talking about least six. We've had a gymnastics teams that have been good. 96 in Atlanta, we were great in gymnastics. We've had Mary Lou Retton, which is a great a gymnastics star in America, who's won gold medals. So we've had, you're acting like this is the only thing, uh, gold medal team we've ever had or something like that. Like our gymnastics teams haven't been great before. We have had great gymnastics back in the day. We've had some. Michael Phelps has proven by breaking all them records. He 
you can't always keep I mean look one minute the the greatest teams always have let down Patriots won three out of four years we won a Super Bowl or the or the the Bulls won three and three they didn't win eight in a row you know sometimes great teams have letdowns Michael Phelps had one year we still won six medals four gold yeah, so I mean, what you said, yes, we've had other gymnastics teams that won. Here's the difference, and here's why 2016 was so amazing to sit and watch. They had the biggest margin of victory um, by the judges scoring in the team events, and they had three separate individual events where two girls got up on that medal stand, which has never happened before for one team. So it wasn't just the team came together and had a good run and they won gold. They dominated the gold by a wider margin than anyone ever had. And then in multiple events, multiple U.S. women were standing on that podium at the end with medals. So they, as a team collectively, won more medals than any other U.S. team had in gymnastics. Time. Okay. Daddy. Daddy. Mm. Daddy. Very good, good arguments between both of you right here. We're going to go into 60 seconds for your final thoughts. Ethan, we'll start with you. 60 seconds begins when you start talking. Yeah, so for me, the reason the 2016 is so amazing is we had the opportunity to see the individuals uh, succeed at the highest level and win gold. And then the great thing about the Olympics is uh, you get those individual moments and you get the team moments. We saw that across the board, the team and the girls all won gold. That was what made 2008 so great. It wasn't just Michael Phelps succeeding on his own the team won gold as well because they came together and you had that beautiful moment in 2012. He took a step back. Athletes are allowed to st take steps back. That's okay. But it, it lessened a little bit. It was a little bit less to watch in 2012. And the team also didn't succeed as well either in 2012 in 2016, those girls came together as, as a team and separately as individuals to achieve the absolute highest peak that any team had ever achieved in Olympics history, let alone in the 2010s. That's what makes the 2016 U.S. women the greatest moment since 2010 Daddy, in the Summer Olympics. Daddy, Daddy, time. Okay. Uh, Dan, start with you. 60 seconds and your final thoughts. We begin to start talking. Look, Michael Phelps had a great year in 2008. We know that. We he had all those medals. But the year when you when you do struggle with your personal life and you do struggle with some things off out of the pool. And then you still come back and you win six medals, two silver, four golds, but the greatest achievement in the history of the Olympics, breaking the all time medals um, record. And now you stand at the top of that uh, podium all by yourself with nobody around you. You destroyed it because then you come back in 2016 and you gain some more medals. We've had Mary Lou Retton. We've had 1986, 1996 Olympic uh, gymnastics that have been good. We've had other great Olympic uh, gymnastics teams. It's just that was just one year, and and you know they haven't been great. They're not going to be great before that, and they're probably not going to be great this year. All right, need this time. Okay. All right then. Um. Hmm. Very both compelling arguments right here for both of you. I'm going to start with Nikki on this one. Nikki, what point an argument that you think is? Well, yeah. Um, they both brought up really good points. Again, uh, the Olympics, women's Olympics team. While well, that one probably emotionally, it, it's kind of a better moment. I, I just think that Dan had the better argument, especially in the third round. Um, we brought up the medal count, the all-time medal count. I, I thought that was a really good point, and uh, I, I would have to give my point to Dan. Okay. Dan. I'm going to start with uh, me. Uh, okay. Very good. I, I think both of you really have understand good back and forth each other what yours is more stand out to that year than your selections but the thing for me who really compelled me on this and the one that was a better argument is Ethan on this one because Ethan explained why his pick right here is more not only emotionally but it's more relevant right here and the accomplishment itself yeah we have previous female winners in gymnastics but I think this one right here is more prominent right here and he also counter uh, dance point right here that 
Dallas had won a couple of gold medals and won big one in 2012, but he pointed out some of the better years along with that. So I had to get my point to Ethan. So Papa Wass, who do you think is going to, who do you think should get this point? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with Ethan as well. Um, Dan, one thing you said, uh, you said um, you're asking, you know, how good did these girls do the Olympics before in 2012? You know, we're probably not going to see them as good in 2020. Uh, so the question is, what is the best moment? Uh, so it doesn't matter what they did the year before or what they're going to do uh, the next year. Um, it's just that that year then and there. Uh, and then you, you did kind of knock yourself too when, when saying, you know, hey, Phelps did have an off year, but it doesn't matter. Um, you, you, you said that uh, right then and there that you didn't pick the best choice. And the only reason you picked that was because of the medal counts. Um, so I, I, I'd have to go with Ethan as well on that one. Okay. Now we got a tie matchup. It's 1-1-2 one, one, right here, and Ethan gets the point right here. Good job. Good job, Ethan, on that one, though. And we're going to round number three. Round number three is – I just want to get guy right here. All right, we're going to round number three, which is uh, Dane strength is Major League Baseball. Currently on a mission right now, but hey, we can still talk about these sports down even stuff up. I mean, on a mission. So, Dan Strait is Major League Baseball. And the question is this for both of you is this Who is the most overrated coach Major League Baseball? So, I'm going to start out with Dan on this one because it's, it's his strength. So, tell me, what is your choice? All right. So, um, Bobby Valentine had a had a decent career in baseball, but um, he, he, he was more known for his managerial. He gets the job in, in New York, becomes the Mets manager, and they end up getting to the World Series against the Yankees. And he, um, but then he leaves and he goes to the Texas Rangers. One of the things he, 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 you know, he brings one team to the World Series and people think, oh, this guy's the greatest thing since sliced bread with the uh, with the New York Mets. You know, it, one of the things, you know, he, he he embarrassed the Mets by by getting thrown out of games and coming back with a uh, fake mustache pretending to be somebody else. I mean, what kind of coach is that? That's embarrassing. You don't do that kind of stuff. Then he goes to the Texas Rangers and they just absolutely stink why he's the manager there. I don't know why he gets a third chance, but after the chicken and beer scandal in Boston, he ends up getting a, basically a great team. He gets handed a great team, and it's the worst team in the history of the Boston Red Sox. After they had just won three World Series in a span of like five years or a nine, seven or eight years or something like, or 2004, 2007, 2013, he gets handed a team that had just won three World Series. And then you, you have the worst record in the history of the Boston Red Sox. I mean, this guy is such an overrated coach. I mean, I'd take Dusty Baker in a Time. minute. Okay. Um, Dan has some good choice for Valentine. Um, Ethan, I wonder which coach you might have for this argument right here. I'm curious. Yeah, so for me, it's Dusty Baker. Uh, and, and the reason being is uh, time after time, organization after organization, uh, they come to the conclusion, we need the coach that's going to push us over the line. We need the coach. We have everything else, but we have to have the coach that is going to win us the World Series. We're a coach away. Who's it going to be? It has to be Dusty Baker. And time and time again, he fails. He falls flat on his face and fails. He is so good at racking up meaningless wins and taking a very talented team that was going to make the postseason regardless to the postseason and then mismanaging his way through the postseason. We'll get into it in the longer argument, but he blew a 3-2 lead when he had the Giants in the World Series and then never went back to the World Series. You had the 0-3 fiasco with the Cubs. You want to blame that on Steve Bartman? That is a tired argument to say that that was Steve Bartman's fault. You needed a manager that was going to calm that team down because that was game six. Didn't have those guys ready to play game seven. Fell on his face there. And then the next season, they were even even better on paper, completely blew up because he still didn't know how to manage that team after that whole thing. 
uh, fell on its face. And that team was still talented after he left, just like the Giants ended up going on a huge run after he left. Uh, Cincinnati Reds, they were ready. 100-win team. Uh, they're ready to go, ready to rock and roll, fell on their face in the playoffs. Washington Nationals, two years in a row. You have Bryce Harper, one of the most hyped players of all time, one of the biggest contracts, fall flat on their face, can't even win a playoff series when he's with them. They fire him. Guess what? They're the reigning champs because Dusty Baker is entirely time. Over Okay. Uh, we got Dancing Legend with uh, with Bobby Valentine and Ethan with Dusty Baker. Two coaches, which I agree with you. They're pretty overrated dudes. I may be the first person to admit this. So, um, then, okay, we start. Guys, will you start? Will the countdown begins with when you start? Look, I, I would take Dusty Baker in a hot minute over Bobby Valentine. This guy, he's an embarrassment to embarrassment to teams he goes in there gets thrown out comes back in with a fake mustache and like gets fined by his own ownership twice in texas and in new york then he takes over a team that just won three world series i mean and then he ends up being the worst record in the history of the boston red sox then a year two years later what happened we win a world series again we won four world series in 15 years of the boston red sox i say we kind of a red sox fan and i know uh this is why these topics are so close to us ethan because you're a cubs fan and i'm a red sox fan so these people really resonate with us but i'll tell you right now i take uh dusty baker all day long over bobby valentine i mean i i I'm not going to disagree with you that if I'm going to have to pick which guy's going to manage my team, sure, Dusty Baker is probably a better regular season manager than Bobby Valentine might take my team to the playoffs, but the question is overrated. And the way I look at Bobby Valentine's rating is exactly what it should be. He is a joke. It is just a fiasco. That's what people do. He's a stopgap manager. The fact that he did come back with that fake mustache on shows you how people should rate him, and I think they properly rate him. You want to talk about the Red Sox specifically? They have a history um, this last you know 20 years that when they are successful, that's what they do. They're successful. Next season's not that great. They're successful. The next season's not that great. So they went in 13. Guess what? They had to clear some money. They had to clear the books. You had the chicken and beer scandal. Who's more perfect? We're going to be bad anyway. Let's put Bobby Valentine out there. When we actually get a good team, we'll get him out of town. We'll get a manager we trust. And that's exactly what they did. And they did it to success. When teams hire Dusty Baker, they're expecting to win it all. And they never do. Well, I'll tell you, I think you're you're putting it on the wrong thing. I think one of the things... Is the the ownership and our and our GM put the teams on the field for the Boston Red Sox? We hire a coach that has had success in New York, and then he brought a team to the World Series. Then he stunk with the worst record in the history of the Boston Red Sox. You guys, the Cubs have had great teams. I would put it on the players, players like Dontrell Willis that stunk for the Cubs. You can't blame Steve Bartman for uh, Dusty Baker. You can't blame Steve Bartman for Dusty Baker. That happened. That that was a mistake that happened. That's not Dusty Baker's fault. But players like Dontrell Willis stunk it up in that playoffs against the Marlins. I mean, I, I'm telling you, Dusty Baker gets his team's ready to play. He gets them into the playoffs. He's done it multiple times. And the difference between Dusty people respect him. Bobby Valentine is a joke. He's an embarrassment to the game. He's been fine multiple times. I mean, come on, Ethan. See, that's what I'm saying, though, is that Valentine is an embarrassment to the game. He is a joke, and teams hire him as a filler. They're like, you know what? This season probably isn't going to be that good. There's not really any coach we want. This guy, he's kind of a sideshow. People will come see him get kicked out. It's fun. We're going to punt on the season anyway. Dusty Baker gets hired to win championships. And in 03, after the Bartman game, all of the players said, Dusty didn't talk to us. He didn't talk to us after that. They were six outs from going to the to a World Series. The Chicago Cubs were. And he had nothing to say. He's just like, well, yeah, you know, we blew it. We blew it. There was still another game to play. And it, with the Washington Nationals, two years in a row, had series leads and both times made mistakes with his bullpen that you cannot justify. Mistakes that nobody would have ever expected. It's Dusty Baker. He's, He's going to take us to World Series. You got what? pitching coaches that are supposed to help them with that stuff. Why do you, that, you got bench coaches that are supposed to help with that stuff? If you have to rely on your pitching coach to make the pitching changes in the playoffs, you're a lost cause already. That begins and ends One with minute. the manager. That begins well, and ends with the manager. That's and completely on him. And I want to tell you something. 
Bobby Valentine was a success in Japan. That's why he got the job in New York. But then when he came, he realized it wasn't the same game as Japan, and he couldn't he couldn't deal with it. He did get the Mets to the World Series, but then after that, he basically stunk it up with the the Rangers. I mean, uh, Nolan Ryan had to fine him. The Red Sox. He, I mean, he got fined in New York. He, he ends up with the worst team in baseball in Red Sox history in Boston. I mean, th- it tells you that this guy is just so overrated that Japan and America, you can't compete with those. They're not the same, you know? I I think, I, I mean, I think Bobby Valentine was good in Japan and he came over. They saw what little success he would have, and teams have properly rated him from that moment forward. He is a mediocre coach that gets signed to coach mediocre teams. Time. Wow. Um, okay, then. Um, very good right here, though. Very good counter arguments right here. I'm going with the final thoughts on Dan on this one. Timer begins. We start talking. Look. The bottom line is Bobby Valentine had a successful career going out of Japan. He gets picked up by the Mets. They make it to the World Series. But he, but he's an embarrassed. He does things that embarrass the franchise. He gets fined by the franchise. Texas grabs him, and he's a complete bust after two or three years in Texas. Nolan Ryan has to find him over there. Then he takes a successful three-time winning World Series team, the Boston Red Sox, yeah, they only had a scandal for the chicken and beer the year before, but they had a winning team. He was inheriting a winning team, and they ended up being the worst team in the history of the Boston Red Sox. And then they go and win World Series after Bobby Valentine. Dusty Baker has brought teams to the playoffs. He's not an embarrassment. He's, he's, He's not overrated. He gets teams to the playoffs. He's a good coach. Players like him. That's the difference between the two. And, yeah. and you can't even quantify who's more. Time. Okay. Are you going to close it on Dan? Yeah, for oh, me. Oh, am I good to go? Well, I was going to say, like, oh. you're up right here. When the time begins, when you start talking. Yep. Yeah, for me, the, the, the question itself is overrated. Bobby Valentine. He was on and off. He had taken a break from coaching before he got the Red Sox job because people knew he was an embarrassment to their organization. Red Sox management knew that season was going to be bad. Fine, we'll hire Bobby Valentine. It's a sideshow. We don't care. Let's move on. This will be better in a couple of years. Dusty Baker, for 30 years consistently, teams say, we are about to win a World Series. Who do we hire? Dusty Baker. And every time he's in the postseason, every time he's been in the postseason with a team that was favored, he has had a lead in that series and that team has blown that lead every single time, every single organization. And he keeps being hired by organizations that are ready to win right now because they think he is the difference. And time and again, it is proven wrong. And yet again, here we are with the Houston Astros None of us like them. They're cheaters, whatever. They still have talent on that roster. Vegas still thinks they can win. Here's Dusty Baker again one more time. That's how they rate him as a series manager. He's not on a read. Them keep it, people keep on hiring him. Okay. <laughs> um, very good arguments between both of you right here, though. You have – both of you have a great argument that why your coaches are overrated right here. So – I'm going to go start with me on this one right here, though. Um, very good arguments between both of you. And, Dan, I love your closing that why his reasons right here sort of different between yours and Dusty Baker are basically more overrated than Ethan's argument right here, though. And then, Dan, your closing right here, though, bring me the home run, no pun intended, of your argument right here, the why your coach is overrated right here. So I'm going to give my point to Dan. Uh, Nikki, your choice right here, and who gets the point? Uh, yeah. Um, one of those things, it's, it's like I fell after this argument that uh, Dusty Baker is adequately rated, whereas uh, Bobby Valentine is just a complete embarrassment that still gets jobs or, or did at the time. Um, so I, I'll give it to Dan as well. Uh, yeah, one of the things that Ethan said was just uh, that Red Sox team was like planned to lose. That was a good team, and they were legitimately pushing Valentine as a manager. So I'll give it to Dan. 
All right. We got two, one, Dan. Uh, Papa was uh, your point would have been at which point were you given to? Uh, I mean, I was I was kind of leaning on the other way uh, with Ethan again on this one. Um, for I mean, the exact opposite of what Nikki said. I I felt uh, Ethan did a good job of saying why Dusty was properly rated, um, whereas Dusty, I mean, people, he he said teams are trying to win the World Series. Hey, let's get Dusty Baker, and he constantly is showing that he can't do anything in the postseason. Uh, so I was leaning with Ethan on that one, but. Uh, that's why we have three people. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to say that Dusty's properly rated when he's supposed to win World Series and never has won one. But that, I mean, it's fine. It is. It's fine. It's no big deal. It's fine. It is what it is. It's okay, Ethan. It's okay. You're not out just yet right here. With a 2 1 lead by Dan right here, you still have a chance to win this game. And we're going into round number four. And round four with your strength, Ethan, is the NCAA. And you pick the football side of it right here. So mm-hmm. the question is this. Hold on. The paper just put that there. All right. The question is this What is the biggest upset in any bowl game ever? So, Ethan, we start out with you. And what game do you pick? Uh, yeah, so for me, it's the 2006 Rose Bowl for the national championship, the Texas Longhorns beating the USC Trojans. Uh, USC was on a 34-game win streak at the time. They had two Heisman winners on that team in Matt Liner and uh, Reggie Bush, multiple future NFL uh, players on that team across the board. They were a seven point favorite. They had won the last two national championships. This was a dominant team. We think Alabama is dominant now. They are. This for this generation was the Alabama before Alabama, and they were winning at uh, an even bigger margin than Alabama was when they were good. This Texas team came in, uh, they were absolute underdogs, seven points in a national championship game. That is huge. You think, oh, it's just a touchdown. No, when Vegas has given someone seven, that is a massive margin to overcome. And you're talking about really a game that people were saying, oh, here's the three-time national champion Trojans. Eh, That Texas team is nice. They play in the Big 12. They play kind of fast and loose and free. They can't handle uh, USC. They can't stop them on defense. And Vince Young, yeah, he did good, but he didn't play anybody. And he came in and put on a show Uh, That is still referred to to this day when people were saying, how's Clemson going to beat Alabama? Well, someone's going to have to have a Vince Young performance. Why do people remember that? Because it's the greatest upset of all time in a bowl game. All right. We got the two after six rolls between uh, the Texas versus USC. Uh, Dan, what game do you pick? I picked the uh, 2007, I believe it is, Fiesta Bowl between uh, Boise State and uh, Oklahoma. Um, Now, Boise State is a team that they don't get any respect. They're on the outside looking into the bowl championship series. This made them change the entire structure of the playoff system uh, when Boise beat Oklahoma how could this possibly happen? This team from Boise, Idaho, they play on a blue field. Nobody gives a crap about them. They go to the Fiesta Bowl, beat one of the biggest powerhouses, one of the best teams in the country at the time. And then at the end of the game, they do a freaking one of the most craziest plays. Nobody saw it coming. The hail, uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty play for Ian Johnson. He runs in in overtime. They win 43-42. And then what happens? They're interviewing him after the game. What does he do? He asks his cheerleader girlfriend to marry him right on the spot. You want to talk about the Disney moment. You want to talk about this had to be a Disney movie. They should have made a movie of this. This is the biggest, most craziest thing in the history of college football. I mean, this thing was mur- – USC – they were good, but so was Texas. Texas is a good team. They had the Heisman Trophy where they handed it out before the game, before, like weeks before the game. So you knew Texas had great players. So that wasn't as big an upset. Nowhere close. Time. All right, then. We had two, I will say, very excellent games. We got Ethan's pit between uh, Texas versus USC and the 2006 uh, National Championship versus uh, dance, but, but the Fiesta Bowl versus Boise State versus Oklahoma. So, fellas, what do you got? 
Yeah, so, I mean, just real quick, Vince Young didn't win the Heisman. He lost it to Reggie Bush, so Texas didn't have the Heisman winner. Uh, they they did have the lesser-rated players at every position on that field. Because Vince Young Matt, didn't win a Heisman trophy. Never he won got, a Heisman trophy. He, got, he was second place to Reggie Bush. Okay, um, all right. And so I thought then, he won the Heisman. No, and then the thing for Boise State and Oklahoma, Oklahoma that season, that was actually a down year for them. They had two losses. Um, one of those losses was to Texas, uh, but, I mean, this, it was a different Texas team. But – uh, they had two losses that season, so they weren't anywhere near station. Remember, this, this is back before the, the playoff. This is championship conversation. They were the Big 12 champions. They got to go to the Fiesta Bowl because of that affiliation. And it was a seven and a half point spread, which is a half point more than my game. But that is actually the closest spread of any non-Power 5 school playing a Power 5 team in the BCS era. So I mean, just to just to clarify what that means that every just, other time I, a non-power fight. Can, yeah, go can ahead. I just quote? I don't want to quote Chris Berman here. I'm going to quote Chris Berman here. You don't know what's going to happen. You can have all those point spreads until they get on the field and play the games. That's what's the most important. Point spreads 100%. don't mean nothing. No, point yeah, spreads don't mean nothing. But, and right, Oklahoma but, is a perennial powerhouse in college football, Ethan. And how can you dis? count them as a powerhouse because they had maybe a couple losses and in Texas beat a team with an illegal player that shouldn't even have been in the game. USC shouldn't have been in there. They won a bunch of games with an illegal player, a player that had a, a vacate Heisman trophies years later because he was cheating. He took money illegally uh, taking money in cars and things like that. So the point of you're saying Texas is the biggest, up, well, they beat a team that shouldn't even been there because they had a legal player. So what were they even being in there in the first place? This is a true underdog story, a Disney story. Like nobody saw Boise state beating Oklahoma, this team from nowhere, Boise, Idaho. I mean, I would say that it's a bigger underdog story than for a team like Texas to beat a team in USC that was cheating. I think that makes it even more impressive if they had all these illegal players and they went out and won anyway. And I wasn't discounting Oklahoma as a powerhouse. Year in, year out, they are. What I'm saying is, of all the other seasons when Oklahoma was winning national championships, this particular year was a down year for them. They only had three players named to all conference, which for Oklahoma is a very low number. Sam Bradford wasn't a thing for them yet. He was a freshman sitting on the bench. They had a journeyman quarterback, senior filling space before Sam Bradford could come in. The writing was on the wall. Was it the best trick play of all time? Absolutely. But that doesn't make it the greatest upset. The greatest upset was the team that was in Texas that was facing you, you you hear all the time, right? Could Alabama beat an NFL team? This was the team that started that. People saying across the board, could USC go beat the worst team in the NFL? Because they had NFL players at every no, position couldn't. across the board. I don't think they, they could either. They but they had that level of players across the board. Texas did not. Texas came in as an underdog, and Vince Young said, boys, this is my night. I'm going to go you put the best coaching. performance of all time. You discount coaching. Uh, you why not give Mac Brown some credit here and say, well, maybe Mac Brown coached his players up and they study. They had a month of, of, of no, no games. Usually what, what's what happened in college football. You have a month, month and a week with no game. Maybe he studied film and looked at the tape and said, oh, this is how we can beat USC and we could beat them. You're, you're taking all the credit. Oh, this is the biggest. Sign. How about Mac Brown? How about the coaches? My game was a pure and simple upset nobody even wanted to give boise state any credit they're out there in boise idaho they're not even in the bowl championship thing they end up getting in because they're the highest ranked um non-conference one minute or whatever say that again one, one minute. minute oh okay and i mean you're just you're just mixing up um what what the whole deal is here when you're interviewing players and they're asking their girlfriend that is disney moments that is just Cinderella moments. That's the moments you make movies out of. Nobody's making a movie out of Texas beating a cheating USC team with Reggie Bush, who's not even supposed to be on the in the game. Because that game doesn't matter if if he's not playing and they're not even going to be there. So that I mean, the, the whole game it should be a wash. We shouldn't even consider that game as a a great game. 
Well, ESPN actually did make a movie about it. They made one of their 30 for 30s. And the reason they did make a 30 for 30 about that game instead of about the Boise game is because the only reason people remember the Boise game is because of one trick play. And that Oklahoma team didn't have star players on it. That USC team was the most loaded team in my lifetime for a college team. And they lost because of great coaching and great time. Wow. Woo. Wow. You two are blow, going blow for blow of your picks right here. I'm loving it right now. So, okay. Final thoughts of final thoughts from you, Dan, right here. When you begin, when you start talking. Yeah, I mean, Texas beat a team with an illegal player. They shouldn't have been in the game. The game shouldn't even matter. They should even they should you know they took the Heisman trophies away from Reggie Bush, Vince Young. I believe I thought I don't know why I mean I, I could have swore Vince won, Young won the Heisman Trophy maybe it was a different year than that year but I could have swore um, maybe somebody should look that up I could have swore he won a Heisman Trophy he he is a great player he's a player you can build around and it's proven in college you can take a great player and win games and you put good coaching with the team and you can get uh you could prepare and beat a team you have a month and a half my game was a pure and simple upset a it just absolute cinderella story with one of the great freaking endings uh of end game in the history and then after that the star player he asked his girlfriend to marry him i mean you can't ask for better than that all right you're gonna concede your time and okay all right ethan Five thoughts. Uh, when you begin, you start talking. Uh, yeah, I mean, my game doesn't have a guy proposing to his girlfriend, but at the end of the day, that has nothing to do with the game that happens, so I'm okay that none of the players on my team propose to their girlfriends. What my game does have is a team that was favored to win every single game for three years straight, and they did so by double digits every single time. The year before, they won the national championship against Oklahoma by 30 points. 30 points. They blew that team out of the water, and that Oklahoma team lost a lot of their best players. They came back the next season, not as good. Boise State beat them. Okay, so what? That same dominant team, that same team that was ranked as the greatest team of a generation, went in with everything on the line. It wasn't a throwaway fiesta bowl. This was for three straight national championships. This is something that teams do not do, that people have never done. They were chasing that. And Texas came in, scouted them well, knew how to stop Reggie Bush, Lendale White, and Matt liner and they came in and won the game because of their coaching because of their playing and they did it they manned up and they beat the best team of all time Time. wow Woo! amazing arguments between both of your guys right here i just really just talk about weight bowl games in general and why your arguments right here are on the other so i'm actually gonna start off with uh Hold on. I'm going to start with uh, Papa West on this one. And Jacob, what argument that swayed you and who deserved this point? Um, This was another really good one. Uh, this one spoke spoke very near and dear to my heart. Uh, one of my first football memories is the 06 Rose Bowl. Uh, that pregame show was the best thing ever with Will's, uh, Will Farrell and Matthew McConaughey just going, going back at each other. With oh, yeah. Will Farrell. Hey, I can't hear you. I have a Heisman in my ear. Matthew McConaughey starts talking. Oh, I can't hear you. I have two. Uh, so yeah, no. Um, Dan, to correct you, Vince Young did not win. He did. He did get second place in the voting. Um, and then the year before uh, was Matt Leinart. Uh, so yeah, surprisingly, Vince Young, uh, one of the biggest, biggest. One second, baby. One of the biggest uh, Heisman um, snubs. Um, which should be another question, Jonathan. Get on that. Um. Give me one second, guys. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to give it to Ethan. Again, just slide us a margin. This was another fantastic one. Um, because he, he was able to discount that Oklahoma team pretty well. Um, man, my kids are attacking me right now. Um, and this was a, a USC team that is going on three years of excellence. Um, a UT team that no one believed in. You can get in all the controversy. Reggie Bush shouldn't have been there. Um, at the time of the game, at that time, it did not matter, though. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with, with Ethan. Okay. All right. Okay. 
Don't worry, Prophet Wise. And I five right here. Get one out, Ethan, right here. All right. Okay. I'm going to go into me on this one. Very good arguments between both of you right here. And for me, the one person for me that really brings a good, great, compelling argument right here and his reasonings are good balls right here of his ball game works is Ethan because he did pull up a great argument right here of why Texas are, are the underdogs right here came to USC. Yeah, they're both undefeated, but at the same time, they came in and just more than just more of a running game depending on Vince Yondo right here and explain why uh, Dance Pick right here, what was a good upset, I don't think it's much sort of bigger and more understandable right here than Ethan's pick. So I'm good at my point to Ethan. So right now, we got to tie game. 2-2. Two, two. Woo. Amazing right here. Uh, Nikki, your point would have been Matt. Where your I, point would have gone to? Yeah, it would have gone to Ethan just because uh, I feel like he an answered the question better. If the question was which of the games was more memorable, I would have given it to Dan. Which one was the bigger upset, though? I got to give it to Ethan. All right. We got 2-2. Two, two. Woo. All right. We got a tie game at 2 2. And what that means is we're going to our speed round, everybody. We got our speed round right here. And what the speed round works is this I'm going to say the question of the speed round right here. And one of you say, and one of the players is going to say their name right here and going to ask what pick they're going to pick right here. Right here. And the other one's going to do right here. Once you say that right here, we get into you getting like a. Uh, I think 60 seconds right here to explain their argument right here. Same thing with the other right here. Which one of you is going to say their name first right here. After that, we will give you 45 seconds, 30 seconds, and after that, 20 seconds right here. And that will be the rule right here. Then. So, everybody ready to go? Here is the feedback question. Who is the worst NFL quarterback to win a Super Bowl? Dan. Dan. He has to say two times. Dan. No, right. he has to say the question two times. Say it again. Say it again. Oh. Right. Who is the worst NFL quarterback to win the Super Bowl? Dan. Dan. All right. Dan. Brad Johnson. Okay. Brad Johnson. Trent Dilfer. <laughs> I knew it. I knew he was going to say Trent Dilfer. All right. I, okay, we're going to speed run right here. We got Brad Johnson versus Trent Dilfer right here, though. And we're going to start with Dan on this one with 45 seconds when you begin talking. Look, Brad Johnson came. Uh, he, he played for a, another team, and he wasn't that good. Then he gets traded, and he, and he, and he ends up signing with the um, – uh, the Buccaneers, I think, is a free agent deal. And um, he he's just not that good of a player. They have good receivers. They have good running backs. They have a good defense, like uh, Lynch, uh, John Lynch. They have the two brothers. One uh, uh, The one brother is a running back. No, no, the one brother is a safety. The other brother plays for the Giants. I forget. I can't think of the names. I'm bad with names. But he gets he played for another team, the Vikings, I believe, Brad Johnson. Then he gets over to the Buccaneers, and he ends up, going to the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl with a coach that had just signed there too because uh, Gruden was with the Raiders the year before. So it was just kind Time. of a team. Okay. We're going to go with Ethan on this one and explain his back. Yeah, so I mean, Trent Dilfer is the exact definition of mediocre. He is not good. And he if he's trending anything other than mediocre, it's Bad. He proved everyone wrong that you need a quarterback to win a Super Bowl. That year with Tampa, he wasn't even the starter. Sorry, not Tampa, Baltimore. When he he started in Tampa, went to Baltimore, wasn't even the starter. He started the final eight games of the season. That includes the playoffs. So he wasn't even good enough to be their starter, but that defense was so good that when he stepped in, they were just like, dude, Trent, all you got to do is have a pulse. If you are alive and you qualify as the 11th man on the field, we will win the Super Bowl because we have Ray Lewis and this incredible defense just please don't die. That's all we need from you. So he wasn't even good enough to be a starter, and he got a ring out of it. That, to me, says you're the worst quarterback to win a Super Bowl. Time. All right. Dan, 30 seconds for you for the rebuttal. Yeah. Dilfer was a highly ranked uh, draft pick. He was drafted by the Buccaneers. They expected him to be good. So he, he ends up going to Baltimore. This guy was expected to be a good quarterback. He is a good quarterback. Brad Johnson 
was a complete bust in Minnesota, ends up in Tampa. They got a great defense, and they got a good running back and a couple of decent receivers. This guy ends up being the quarterback of a, a Super Bowl winning team with a coach that wasn't even supposed to be there. He ends up coming over in the offseason from Oakland. All right. Time. Uh, 30. Ethan, 30 seconds with yours. I mean, I think the fact that Trent Dilfer was expected to be good makes this even worse uh, for him because he was expected to be good and he wasn't good. Brad Johnson, uh, while he had kind of a middling career, the year that Tampa won the Super Bowl, he was 13-3 and three as the starter, threw for uh, like over 3,000 yards, and he had a good season. He had a very good season for them, and he did more than what John Gruden asked him to do. He succeeded at an incredibly high level for that team that year. Meanwhile, Trent Dilfer wasn't even good enough to start for them and just kind of fell Time. backward. All right. All right, Dan. 20 seconds for the final. My bottle. 20 seconds, Dan. Go. Well, sometimes you don't need to do a whole lot to be a, a quarterback of a Super Bowl winning team. You have a defense like Ray Lewis and Ed Ed Reed and all those guys that are on that defense. Just do your job. Get in there and do your job. Brad Johnson, he this guy, never nobody saw that coming with Brad Johnson in Tampa that year. Yeah, he was thirteen three, but still nobody saw it coming. Time. All right, Ethan. Uh, I agree. With I agree with you. Nobody saw it coming, and he had a great season, which means he was a good quarterback for at least the time that he was in Tampa. He succeeded, and he had to be good on their offense for them to score. Trent Dilfer, they expected him to be good. He was bad, didn't earn a starting job in Baltimore, got the honorary start in the Super Bowl, and the defense won it for him while he was still a bad time. Okay, then. Wow. Woo. Okay. For the final one. I had to go. My judges first, Nikki. Who gets the point? Oof, that was um, that was relatively even speed round, but I think one of you was just uh, more fitting of the speed round. Your personality just fits the speed round better, and uh, it really came down to who had a better round one because the other two rounds, I think it was relatively even. So I'm going to give it to Ethan. I think you had the better speed round. My point goes to you. Okay, I'm going to get this one to Mr. Papa West right here, and who will give this point? So y'all both did a great job of saying why uh, your quarterback was a bad quarterback. Uh, it, with this one, it's really coming down to what you said about uh, the other other player's quarterback. Um, you know, Dan, the biggest thing you said was he did just enough to, to win, so with the defense – um, could win it uh, with with Trent Dilfer, um, and then Ethan saying that you know Brad Johnson had a had a really good year, going thirteen and three, uh, a couple thousand yards uh, passing, and said he had a really good season. Uh, well, yes, his season didn't match up with the rest of his career. Um, I'm still gonna go with Ethan just for being able to to counter uh, Brad Johnson. Okay. And your winner in his first match debut, Ethan, the Electric Klein. Congratulations, Ethan, right here. All I'm saying is both of you, I'm only point would have gone to Ethan also. So congratulations, Ethan. Whew. Great battle it out right here. Though. Three, two, right here. Ethan, how are you feeling, buddy? Uh, good. I mean, it's like I said, I was just looking forward to getting into some of these leagues, getting started and, uh, you know, TV fights went well for me the other night and now we got a good start here. So just keep going. I just love doing it. I love having fun, just uh, debating and talking sports and all that stuff. So it was a good time. Very good indeed. Uh, Ethan, congratulations on your first victory against Dan Skip Allen right here. And I got a little bit of surprise for you right here uh, for your next match right here. I took something very special for the Sports Brawl Season 2 so far, and I got something set to do with Papa West of some certain extent, but not fully yet. I will say this. I cook up something, maybe at the time I put this on YouTube right here, I may have posted something on the Facebook group, a potential of rookies bracket with brand new players coming into the league for Sports Brawl Season 2. What I mean by that is... 
I set up a little mini tournament right here with you being Dan right here. We might face up the potential winners, uh, potential Nikki or Amu right here against your next round right here. There, one, two, the rookie player wins this tournament, and we might have a potential match between Papa West for the championship belt and a little additional surprise, but I'm not going to tell you full extent about it yet. So, right now, congratulations, Ethan, right here. You feel proud of yourself. And let me interview, uh, just want to say, the losing player right here, Dan Skibau. And, Dan, I just want to say, you did great. Just really did a fantastic job right here. How are you feeling right now? I mean, it's it's just a matter of the points that, that we make and what what resonates with the judges. And, obviously, uh, the, you guys said a lot of these – a lot of these arguments were very, very, very close, and it just it just came down to what uh, arguments uh, resonated with you as a particular judge. It seemed like uh, Jacob really liked a lot of uh, Ethan's uh, arguments, and that made a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Very good indeed. Uh, I just really just want to say a great job on your arguments right here, though, and just want to congratulate for both of you. Both of you do put a great stellar views right here. I'm not going to see the last of the, both of these guys right here. I might see you anytime soon on Sports Roll in some capacity in the future. So I just want to go to our judges right here. Uh, the judges, how are you two feeling right now? Sorry, you're probably um, less. Uh, I'm excited to play someone. So I don't care what you, what you set up, Jonathan. Uh, just send them my way so I can take them down because uh, I want that belt uh, and I want to beat Sean. Uh, but no, this was a good one. Um, Ethan and Dan did a great job. Uh, I cannot wait to see what both of them have down the road. Um, and I definitely look forward to playing both of them uh, in the near future because I know they have they have the uh, capabilities. Okay. Nikki, what about you? I echo what Papa West said. I mean, just put me aside, all inside a bunch of competitors, and I'll pass them all. Um, but great job by both of these guys. Dan, you really resonated with me early in the game. And uh, Ethan, the, your arguments with the speed round and uh, the ra- the fourth round really resonated with me more than his. So it's just how you argue those points. Whoever answers the questions better. It, it drops differently every time. You guys both did a great job. And uh, no no losers here, only winners, you know, except Ethan, you're the winner. So, yeah. All right, indeed. Uh, okay. Well, this is a good clue of sports brawl match between our winner, Ethan Klein, versus Dan Skip Allen right here, though. I had to – this has been a little late night right here. I just want to say the courtesy of Papa West, to the courtesy of Nikki Sullivan, to our competitors, Ethan and Dan, to me, the host and the admin, Mr. Charles, the Pat, Dr. Magic, just want to say take care. Good night, everybody.